Finally, he took the shot. What do you think a week, 10 days later, I saw him doing? That was the, that was, well, was uh, not very fun to see. Anyway. You've seen that already. So I wanted to have a map of, of 1914, uh, around the time that my grandfather was spending his last year in St. Petersburg. He went there, my grandfather went to St. Petersburg in um, 1898 as a 13-year-old boy with Salar as my great grandfather. Just think how forward-thinking these people were back then. In 1898, he takes them 2,300 miles away. They lived together in St. Petersburg for five years. Salar Mazas, my grandfather, studying with Rimsky Korsakov directly. Nasser Sultan, my grandfather, studying with Alexander Glazunov, who later on became the uh, director of the conservatory in St. Petersburg. Because Rimsky Korsakov had sided with the constitutionalists and the students and uh, the protesters, and so they removed him and they put in Glazunov. But I wanted to show this because um, I wanted you to see that of all the countries that we hear about now in that region, the only two really, these two, there was an Afghanistan and there was Iran. There was no Saudi Arabia. There was no Gulf states. And I hate when the news and the, even some Iranians say this, I can't believe it. They call it the Arabian Gulf. There is not, no body of water is called the Arabian Gulf. It has a Persian Gulf, and that's what it's been for centuries, for centuries. And you know, I found maps from a thousand years ago that says Sinus Persicus, something like that, in the Gulf, whatever. So I wanted to show this to show that these are the two countries that remain. It's a, Afghanistan, we know why, because it's a mountainous country. There's not much going on, so uh, it's a difficult country to control. Um, here, this is the Ottoman Empire, so no Iraq, no Kuwait, none of these UAE, and all these countries that are now, you know, like in their heyday. Um, no, uh, you know, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, this is all just the Russian Empire. And how sad, look at the name of this, British India. I mean, just that, you know, it's India. But the British went there, and now they call it British India. I mean, it's just disrespectful. So that bothered me. Just wanted to put it up there. <laughs> this is, uh, I tried to do a little thing just to show you where my grandfather left and had to go all the way to St. Petersburg. That's a Baltic there. Um, it's very close to the Arctic Circle, you see. Um, and in my book I wrote, they say, the locals say, you know, sunrise lasts until sunrise comes again because it's up there. Um, but this was 2,300 miles. And it was very difficult to go through here, the Caucasus Mountain, mm -hmm. Caucasus, very difficult. So they had to go through the Caspian. So what they would do is they would go from Bandar Anzali here to Baku, and then from Baku they would go some way to St. Petersburg. So chapter four, of, I think, of my book has that, where he's coming back and he has to go. And it's a, a very funny when I uh, did the research on this, that People would leave uh, Baku, come to Bandar Azali, a mile off the shore because it was so stormy. They would have to go back to Baku. They couldn't even. I'm here that close. That happened to my wife and I. We went to Greece, to um, the island of Naxos, and we wanted to go back to Athens. And the ferry came, and it came like where that chair is to me, and it couldn't dock just out of there. And so we had to stay an extra day because it just could that little distance. And uh, you not, might not be aware that the Caspian Sea, when it has its tenter tantrums, which I've been, you can have waves of 20 feet high on this Caspian Sea. So that's one. Now, this is uh, my grandfather, Nasser Sultan, in 1905 in St. Petersburg. Uh, 13 years old, but you know, he might look a little older because Iranian boys of 13 can look 17, you know. Yeah. That's why when we came here, it was very easy to get fake IDs. <laughs> you know, I was like 17, I was getting a fake ID 21 for a 
Uh, and these are some Russian, just, you know, I just thought it's interesting to see these photos because uh, this typical Russian looking people and the ladies, and he has a clarinet in his hand, you can see it. This guy too. This is Sarah Mazas, my great grandfather. He um, was the head of what was called the Cossack Brigade Band. So the king at the time was named uh, Nasser Din Shah of the Qajar dynasty. And Nasser Din Shah was actually a very forward-thinking man. And one of his uh, projects was to have a bad music. You know, he wanted to bring music um, into the forefront in Iran. Uh, music in Iran um, was basically a private affair. Like if you wanted to study music, uh, there was no conservatory, there was no you know, university, nothing like that. So you would go to a master's house uh, in, the, in the privacy of the master's house uh, to the point where some people actually were scared to even carry their instruments, like their violins, and I've written that in the book also, uh, showing it. They would hide it under their cloak because if some of the conservatives or reactionaries saw it, they'd break it. And there was this um, part in my book where I write that Nasser, Nasser Sultan talks to his father and says, I want to stay in St. Petersburg and write symphonies and be like Sorinsky, my own uh, you know, peer, uh, because um, people here don't get it. They don't get this new music and all that kind of stuff. And father, isn't it you that said more, most Iranians uh, that hear this kind of music like the tuning part of it more than that? Symphony itself. <laughs> that sounds like Persian. <laughs> um, so I just thought that that's interesting. That in 1909, look at this. They're all using, you know, trumpets and uh, you know all these different woodwinds, and and he taught most of this. He was a very good tar player to Sarawaza. So the reason I put this 1909 is uh, at the time Tehran. Uh, so Nasruddin Shah dies, Mozafar Ali Shah dies, Mozafar Ali Shah's son, Muhammad Ali Shah, comes to power. He didn't like this um, newfound democratic movement that had happened after the 1906 constitutional uh, signing of the Constitution, which was based on the Belgian Constitution, so it allowed for freedom of press, uh, separation of religion and state. I mean, think of it, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, whatever it is, 110 years ago. That's what they've done. And now state and religion are the same, no freedom of press, you know, all of that. Um, and Muhammad Ali Shah had this man by the name of Colonel Liakov, which was a Russian colonel, become the military governor of Tehran. And so Tehran had become basically like a prison. You know, they, didn't let people come in, they didn't want, they didn't let people leave, they didn't want. Some resistance fighters from the north of Iran, Sattar Khan and a bunch of others, come down from the Azerbaijan region and they help defeat Khan. And they take back the parliament. He had shelled the parliament, he had killed a lot of the, executed a lot of the resistance fighters. And when they did, my great-grandfather was so excited because they were very liberal thinking. He wrote the first Persian national anthem in 1909. And this is it. And I want you to hear it. piece in there, pe people that are familiar with the Subur de Shah and Shahi that we remember, that we had to get up every movie theater you went to, every show. They would play this, not this, 
they would play the Suru Chanchai, which was the new Persian national anthem. But they did take a melody from this. Da 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 the famous melody, they took it from this. It's a little plagiarism there for the guy. <laughs> but that was the first Persian national anthem, and it was the first Persian national anthem ever played outside of Iran. Because Ahmad Shah, the son of Muhammad Ali Shah, who liked to eat. <laughs> he was with, that's him, you. There's a difference. And look, he's the British guy. Isn't that funny? These days it would be the reverse. The Iranian guy would be a skin, and the British guy would be big. But back then, he was very good. And so he visits London, state visit, in 1919. And they played this Persian national anthem there. And Prince Albert comes, the son of Victoria, Queen Victor, comes to uh, greet him at Dover and then accompanies him to uh, London. And there they are with Lloyd George and the rest. Look at the Iranians. It's amazing. I love this photo. So I wanted to. And that's look, Prince Albert, you go back and you know, it's like very uh, shy. Now, this is Salar Mahazaz, my great grandfather and his youngest son, Nasser Sultan's young brother, Ghulam Hosseini Bashan. Ghulam Hosseini Bashan became the director of the Iranian Conservatory. He studied in Berlin and in Geneva, the conservatories. And he came back, and in uh, 1933, he started, uh, he became the head of the conservatory, but he also started the Tehran Symphony Orchestra, which today is still in the Palarudaki of past. I think they call it Palarudak now or something. But they still perform uh, classical Iranian and uh, Western music. That's Nasser Sultan in 1913, my grandfather. And he was in, P uh, in St. Petersburg. And you can see he went to a, one of those places that we used to go where they had fake background <laughs> stuff. You know, where you'd stand and then they had all that stuff that looked like you were outside but you inside. And um, I assume that's the uniform they had to wear for some sort of classes or something, I don't know. But I didn't know at all that he had gone in 1913 back to St. Petersburg. I thought that he was a child, he'd gone. But my uncle sent me an article. And that's the beauty of documenting, as I said, your stories because there's some things Google doesn't have. And I couldn't find that most of them are Persian things that Google doesn't have, or articles in Persian, or books in Persian. And my uncle sent me an article from like 50 years ago that said Nasser Sultan, he came back to Iran, all that. and then in 1913, for one year, went back to finalize his studies. And it said it in 1913, one year, and that was the one year. That's my grandma, Matt. And look at her, 1919, Iran. I mean, can you believe it? This is like, it's amazing to me that, you know, now, it, so people's impression of Iran is like, oh, you know, everybody's covered up and everything. That's 1919. And she was the one who told me the story. This is 1923, Nasser Sultan here, with a bunch of Russian people and Iranians. I think this is Lyakov, I'm not 100% sure, because by the time we see other photos of Lyakov, he has a full beard and this handlebar. Um, but I think it is him, and it's interesting for me to see him. What do the kids do? You know, I just thought it was interesting. Though. Now, this is 1925, Reza Shah, Pahlavi, and my grandfather, Nasser Sultan. And what's interesting is that in, in, um, I'll come to that later. This is 1930. This is the year that he became a colonel and then became the head of the conservatory of, of Iran. Dar al Funun's music school, music, Madrasay uh, Music is what they call it. This is uh, Mossadegh, the, the prime minister of Iran that many know that the US and England were involved in getting rid of him and bringing the Shah back. And this is Alayar Saleh. His right-hand man, trusted advisor, uh, the grandfather of Shaheen Tabrizi right there. I mean, the, the grand-uncle, the brother of his grandfather. 
Chinese Cold War. And so, Al Arisale comes with them to the United States in 1951. And then in 1955, I think it is, Mossadegh, as Prime Minister, appoints Al Arisale as, as uh, ambassador of Iran to the United States under Truman. And he was the last person to be with Nasser Sultan. The story, how, can I ask a question? How many have actually read the book? Wow. OK. Those who have not, you can't have the rest of the story. <laughs> no. So yes, at the end of the story. They're going to buy it and read it. OK. So I, that's why I'm trying not to give away to him. You know, I don't want to say stuff that ruins the story. But he was with him towards the end of his life. Now, this is my uncle Mehdod Pahbor, born Ezzatullah Min Bashyan, uh, the brother of, uh, the son of Nasser Sultan, the, the middle son. This is Princess Shams, the daughter of Reza Shah. So this picture is in 1956, uh, in Abadan, Iran. And uh, Mrs. Ramazania uh, knows Abadan very well. Abadan is where the oil petroleum, uh, the uh, refinery was, and where the Iraqis hit right away when the Iran Iraq war happened. It's right on the border, the waterway. And it was funny, I showed that picture in 1925 of Reza Shah and my grandfather, and th they married in 1945. So 20 years later, they had no idea that their kids would marry. I'm just showing this to show the interrelation between the, you know, Pahlavis at that time and our family at that time. And that is Dizzy Gillespie, the famous jazz musician. In 1956, he went to Abadan, you know, I mean, think of that. You know, he was on a world tour uh, for, you know, music promotion and so forth. I just thought it's very, very interesting. And in 1964, the Shah appoints him the first ever minister of culture of Iran. And that is Fatullah Mibasha, my the, the oldest son of Nasser Sultan. And he became, here he is a three-star general, as you see. But uh, he became a four-star general at Kashkut, commander of all Iranian ground forces. And with the Shah, they're in Shiraz, outside of Shiraz, during war games. And I like this picture because the way the Shah is pointing and he's looking. So he's probably asking him, you know, why is that tank doing one of the words? <laughs> So I didn't want to do a reading because I thought, you know, I've been to readings myself and, you know, it can get monotonous and boring. I mean, not everybody's is, but I thought mine would be. So we had um, some uh, audiobook trailers, just two that I wanted to play for you because this man that did the narration, he's a British voice actor, he's famous, Tim Fearon. He just did a wonderful job. You, you heard the audio book, right? Yes. yes. Um, he really did it. It was wonderful. amazing. So you didn't read the book? No. Oh. <laughs> I can't. I fall asleep. Okay. I listened to this for 17 hours. As you felt. No, okay. I was going to sleep. So let's see if I can have this for you. As he studied the intricate details of his work, it was as if he could almost hear the painting. This surprised Nasser Sultan as he began to recognize similarities between music and painting. He noticed that both shared principles of rhythm, harmony, and balance. The same rhythm he used in his compositions, inviting listeners to sway to the music, was used here by Matisse inducing Nasr Sultan's eyes to dance from one point of this painting to another. And just as Nasr Sultan used musical motifs to give his melodies their overall balance, the artist had used this same balance to add structure to harmony in red. A harmony and balance that, as of late, was missing in Nasr Sultan's life. So this is one day when Nasser Sultan is having a hard time, some events are happening, I'm trying not to give away, but people have read it now. And so he decides I'm gonna to go to the Hermitage Museum and clear my mind, look at art like we usually do when we go to museums. That really is a very comforting thing. 
And the reason I put this in here, where Nasa Sultan almost could hear the painting, you know, people think that that's weird. How can you hear something you're seeing? Because I have this. I have something called synesthesia, which means perceiving together. And that means that one sense triggers another sense. So some people can eat, say, an onion and they see the color blue. Or one person can hear music and see colors. I see colors for the days of the week. So whenever you say Monday, I see red. You say Tuesday, I see green. Wednesday, dark brown. Thursday, blue. Friday, a lighter green than the Tuesday. Saturday, gray and Sunday, brown. So whenever you say Sunday, I think, okay, brown. So December 12th, Sunday, I saw it as brown today. And tomorrow's gonna be red. That's why I put it in the book, that you can hear the painting. This, this is another um, audiobook trailer. They're very short, I didn't wanna. This is, and I have to tell the story of this. So, there's always this debate about what's better, chess or backgammon. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I personally prefer chess, but I love playing backgammon because it's more fun, you know? Because you don't need that much skill. In chess, you need skill. And so, um, the, the dice really help in backgammon, as we all know. You get joke sheesh, the two sixes come and you know, your opponent's almost gone. You get a few of those double sixes and that's it. And so there's a, there's a point in the book where Nasa Sultan actually is playing a game of backgammon with a lady that he's interested in, Madame Shamsi. Her name was Shamsa Zaman, but she had gone to France and she liked to be called Madame Shamsi. And she had a thing that she also liked. And you know, this is again our Persian culture. We had many friends and family that do that stuff. You know, like all of a sudden they go for two days to France, all of a sudden everybody's in the show, Madame. And so, <laughs> Madame Shamsi also liked to call the men Monsieur, Monsieur, you know, back then. Or you. And um, <laughs> it rubbed the commander of the garrison the wrong way, so he didn't like it. But Nasser Soldan's playing with her, and he starts to try to divert her attention because he's losing. And he realizes, oh, I don't want to lose to her because they made a bet. And the bet was that if he wins, she will sing. If he loses, he will have to play for her. But he didn't like to be considered a higher, like a motret. In Iran, as I said, the music began, you know, here, right away, you jump on the piano, but there, you know, they didn't like that. So Nasser Sultan starts saying the story to her of um, how the game of backgammon was created. And the king of India sends a gift to the Persian kingdom uh, of the game of chess when they created it. With all the elephants as being, you know, we say rook, but those are a field and all that, you know, now it's bishop here, but you know, we have field, elephant. And so, um, Nasokan's talking to her about this game, and the king sends this gift as a kind of a little bit of a brag, you know, because whenever in those days a kingdom or a king would give a gift to another one, that was more precious so you couldn't even find it. Uh, it was a kind of bradavisha. It was a little bit of a, we got this, we're giving it as a gift to you. And so the Iranian king decides, you know, hey, we need to, you know, <laughs> counter this gift. What are we gonna do? And so this is the, he, he makes the gift of back. When the Indian king sees this, he laughs in front of his court and he says, the Persians, I mean, this is not very smart of them. They've taken our game, they just put wooden coins and some, nothing at all like our beautiful game. And this is Nasser Sultan's answer to that. Let me see if it works. Nasser Sultan found her sudden interest in his table of music. And as he looked around, he noticed many of the bystanders were also listening to their conversation. With an ever-expanding audience, Nasrul Sultan continued. The Persian king wrote, Most gracious king of the empire of India, we are truly grateful for your wonderful gift to our court. However, 
there was one slight flaw that we have corrected with our gift to you. In your game, there is no provision for chance. Everything depends on strategy. But as you are aware, Great King, just as in life, chance plays a major role in the outcome of events. Therefore, we have included dice, which makes the battle between two armies more realistic. There is always something unforeseen and not planned for that can derail a campaign no matter how well strategized. Hence, the dice adds this element of chance missing in your gift of Shafran. <laughs> so I think this next slide uh, is the song. There's a song, there's a piece of music in this book that's central to the whole story. Mm -hmm. And it's a piece of music that Nasser Sultan takes to the princess to teach her. And it's Franz Schubert's Fantasia in F minor. It's beautiful. Um, I was lucky enough that uh, I was doing an interview with the World Affairs Council in San Antonio, and they brought two wonderful Russian pianists, classical pianists. They had like three doctorate degrees from the Moscow Conservatory each. I mean, I couldn't believe that you could get that many degrees, and they're just fantastic, two ladies. And they sat side by side and played the music that Nasser Sultan and was teaching Irina on the hands touching and all that stuff. The a lady there was kind enough, an Iranian lady there, just recorded it and sent it to me. I have just put about 58 seconds of it because I wanted you to hear the beauty of this melody. It's very romantic. And Franz Schubert wrote this the last year of his life, in 1828. He was a very prolific uh, composer. He uh, dies at the age of like 30, 31. And he had dedicated this to Countess Caroline Esterhazy, who was teaching, because he had a passion for her, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't reciprocated, or he never really told her. I don't know what happened, but he dedicated this to her, and this is it. So I apologize that the photography is not; somebody else did it. So she's not showing the room, I guess, to show me that there were some people there. It was right after COVID. A little bit, so there's not many people there, but there you go. these stories you have about something your grandmother told you. Something, for example, Karadine uh, Zumra Razania called me and said, uh, I remember some story from long ago, some woman who loved the music, you know, it, it touched me that a book that I wrote could make people remember certain stories. And so if this has done that with you, I appreciate it if you would do this because we will all benefit, not only your children, but, you know, other Iranians. And this is the final uh, little thing here. The reason I put this up, of course, is to show you it's an ebook, paperback, hardback now, and um, audiobook. But what's important for me is this, or ask for it at your local public library. Because libraries are hurting, mm -hmm. and they get funding and budget uh, based on, a lot of times, the demand. You know, if people are checking out books and people are asking for books, and if they're not, they won't get maybe the budget they need. 
And so please go to your local libraries if you want my book. Of course, you're welcome to buy it, but if you want to go to a library and ask for it, that would be great. So I thank you. If you have any questions, I'd love to. I want to take a picture of you all here because nobody has this vantage point.